just a little crap thing that we do to sync the audio. Yeah. Point is that you have to have no ego when you practice. Right. And then you can have the biggest ego when you go and you go into a competition. Yeah. Rehan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to sit and talk to someone who is as decorated as you are. And uh, uh, the thing is that for a guy who has achieved so much, I personally feel that you're very humble. You're very approachable. So, you know, it's great to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, if I was a six-time national champion, and if I had represented India at the Olympics, Arjuna Award and Iklavi Award, right? Mera thoda kiska hota in a way. Like I would have been here. Yeah. So, so, so is it like, didn't that ever occur to you that, you know, okay, I'm the champ. So when you go out, I have an image to maintain. Or maybe you get a little, it, it, it must be eight years ago, right? Eight or nine right. years ago. It, that my last competitive race was in 2012. 2012. So um, I, I, it did. And I did try to maintain that sort of persona. But that was only when I competed. Right. So when I was at a, at a tournament. Uh-huh. I went into the tournament trying to, or not really making an effort to, but I would love to feel right. like everybody around me knows who I am. Who I am, not right. really who I am, but that I am here to have taken, you know, your yeah, the first spot, and yeah. then everybody else can right, fight right. for second. We we'll get part. into that champion mindset in a bit. Only in a competition. Right, right, right. But it never got into your head, like when you were out or meeting people or in public places. Right? Not really. Uh, I mean, in public places, once in a way, you do get recognize you get an sure, autograph sure. coming also and right. that's sweet yeah. but it was never on my mind that i want to walk in and i want everybody to know that you know huh. i'm the six time whatever or mm-hmm. an yeah. Arjuna Wadi. Right. i've got a fantastic pr team to do that for me sure. though, <laughs> who make sure everybody knows who i right, am when right. i walk into right. an important event but on a day-to-day basis that's never on my mind honestly it's not a priority yeah. and uh, it, it it's also i think very tiring to do something like that where you everywhere you go, you want people to notice you. Okay. You want to be felt, you know, feel like you're important. After a while, it just gets too intense and tiring. I'd rather just be a normal person, which is who I am. I think. Right. I'm sure. So, have you ever thought that people like, uh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo or right. Messi or Michael Phelps in that? Right. So when they go out, how sure. would life be? I mean, they can't even sit at a cafe and have. No, and, and to give you the best example at the Olympics, right? Uh, Roger Federer was a part of the 2008 Olympics where I yeah. swam at. Yeah. And uh, like every other athlete Beijing. He, in Beijing, yeah. like every other athlete, he's also he has to come into the big food hall sure. to have his breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. Uh, so he was doing that, but after, from the first meal that he had, he couldn't basically sit down and have a cup of coffee because he was constantly mobbed and being asked for by pictures. the athletes, by other athletes, athletes who are yeah. also champions and Olympians. Right. So you've got another Olympic gold medalist. Coming to Roger Federer and asking him for it because everybody there is respecting everybody and it's an appreciation of who they are. So he had to check out of the games village and go and stay in a hotel. So, and that's at the Olympics now in a day to day, day to day life, I'm sure he also gets that a lot. Right. And it's, I, I, I've always uh, derived uh, positivity and been on a high when you get that sort of attention. Now, when you're talking about a Ronaldo or a Federer, right. Or, you know, the biggest names in sport. Right, right. It's, gets like i said it's fantastic but i'm sure after a point it also tends to be a little exhausting i'm sure because because you all the time have to you know you're thinking about what to say you have to be very careful because when you've got so many eyes on you right and so many people listening to what you have to say you have to be very responsible also right because a lot of that audience are youngsters Right. And children to whom you are a role model. Hmm. So it's a mixed bag. It's not that life is only amazing because you're a big celebrity. Right. Right? There also is a big responsibility on your shoulders, which at times I think tends to be uh, tiring. Yeah, I, I saw an interview where he said that if I could, you know, pay money for it, for my privacy outside, like right. to have, I would do that. I would pay for right. it. Like, but that he's saying <laughs> in retrospect after experiencing. Right, right. So the, it's not for everyone. It's like not he has for experience everyone. There. And if, if he hadn't experienced it, I'm sure he wouldn't. Sure. You know, he would pay money to be in the spotlight. Yeah. So once you, you're part of that whole, um, you know, you have that reputation when you walk into a restaurant or a, you know, or a public gathering and then right. you see people all come to you. It, it's definitely great you're on a high because at the end of the day, what an athlete, when he has that love from people, it's appreciation for mm. his hard work. Right. At least that's how I look at it. Right. Athletes, no matter whether you're an Olympic champion or you're not, no mm. matter what level you play at, we, very, we work very hard to be successful. Right. Right. And when uh, people around you come to you for love or for a conversation also, 
right? It, it, you feel nice because that's you look at it as appreciation for the effort you put in mm. over a decade or two decades or more sometimes. They get inspired as well, right? So, uh, does it feel like yesterday, are the memories still fresh of awards and Olympics and championships? Does it feel like, you know, it was just yesterday? Uh, it doesn't feel like yesterday, but it's definitely fresh. These memories can never, you know, disappear. Right. Because, I mean, the, you know, we've got my trophy wall up hmm. in my house. We've got a new home in Pune. So, right. we are right here in the city. So, right. we've got a nice little corner where we put up all my trophies, a nice medal stand. So wake up to that. And you wake up to that, you pass right. it on your way to training, which is golf for me mm. now, my second sport. You So every day it's in your face. Right. So you can't possibly forget it. It's also nice because I think it's like a reminder mm. uh, to who you are or who you've been. And that never goes away. You've, so, you've been an asset to the country. You, no one can deny that. I mean, it's. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> in the zone zone right now because I'm still in awe right now oh, that I'm sitting in front of you right now. It's because, you know, there's so much to learn. That's the point. There's, there's so much experience that you carry, right? Sure. So let's just start with your training. Not like ra- right now, right now, but right. the beginning years of your swimming. When the coach saw you and he said, bada tez tarta, isko, right. isko academy mein dalo. Those, those kind of days. Sure. So like, how did it start? What mindset did you have? Were you like extremely focused or were you casual, but you were just good at it? Like, you know, naturally. Right. Right. So, yeah. I think um, early years, it was... Bombay, right. where I uh, started at the Wellington Sports Club, then I moved to... The, How old were you at that time? Uh, I was seven when I started. Seven, right. And I was very competitive from a young age. Hmm. So I just had to win. You know, that was my priority. That was, your and thing that that was always my priority. And I think everything that, in terms of effort, was driven by that goal to win. Right. So by the time I was nine, I was at the Autos Club in Bombay. And right. then I was competing, winning silvers and bronzes hmm. at state level. And at 11, I became a national champion in okay. my age group. That was the under, under 11 category. Under 11. Okay. So at that point, I clearly knew I had some level of talent. I hmm. may not have been a breakaway one in a million talent, but right. I knew I was talented. Right. But what uh, I what came from within was I was very hardworking. Hmm. And part of it was because I was just innately disciplined as a child. Right. And uh, also because there was a there is a lot of pressure when you compete from a city like Bombay. Because your education pressure is high, your pressure to perform is high. And this is pressure, outward pressure and pressure, inward pressure. Even the athletes are better in compared to other states. When uh, in Bombay, uh, we've got some good swimmers, but they last only up to age group, which okay. we can come to later. But right. from a point of, from the age of 14, 15 and onward, right. the best athletes don't come out of Maharashtra. Okay. okay. You know, they come out of other cities. You're just talking swimming, uh, right? I'm, no, I'm talking about a, a lot Jaya of sports other sports as well. And that's because the whole system is not set up. I think uh, your culture, your lifestyle in Bombay right. is not set up to right. build a, a, you know, an Olympic champion. <coughs> In terms of education, in terms of the support he has from outside as well. So a lot of the good swimmers and athletes, Maharashtra has lost them to other states. Okay. Like for example, Karnataka. I spent 14 years of my life, my whole swimming career was you in Bangalore. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but at a, if you're talking about just uh, in the early days, yes, I had coaches come up to my parents and tell them that uh, this boy will be a champion no matter which pool he trains at. Right. Even if he trains with a coach who's an absolute idiot, right. he's still going to figure out how to be a champion so because that. he's got... So those are nice yeah. things to hear from coaches. Right, right, right. But like I said, I was always hardworking and I've always believed if you've got some sort, some amount of talent mm. and then you combine that with a good work ethic, you right. have a champion. Sure. Sometimes if you're an extremely talented child will win his gold medals a little earlier than... A child who's not as talented. Sure. But yeah. eventually you will find success. Hmm. The important thing is to have that combination, which is what I had, which right. is why I feel I was successful. Right. So that was your, you know, early stages in training. Right. So yeah. How did you progress after that? This uh, was 11 when you 11 won. At, at 12, actually, I had a pretty bad year. Okay. Um, I, from being national champion at the age of 11, at 12, I wasn't good enough to qualify for the nationals. Right. So you can see how, you know, you already at, okay. at such a young age, I experienced an up and right, major right. yeah, down, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is when I moved to Bangalore. Okay. And uh, in a year of training in Bangalore, I was back on top again. Right. So it clearly, and I've, ever since I can remember, I've always been uh, disciplined. Right. And I've always known 
I've had the habit of knowing what I need to do to reach my goals. But at 11 or 12, Rehan, people, you know, we, we are very young. It's like, right. you know, so how was the support like your, from your family? My my parents, which is basically family that took me through, they've always been rock solid in right. terms of support. So there was never a day where I felt like my dad or my mom aren't going to be there for me. Okay. And that whole move that I had from at the age of 12 right. from Mumbai to Bangalore was a big step. The only balance they did was that they make sure I was a good student and, right. I, and right. I studied well. Right. It was never about making grades, you know, or... grades. As long as my grades were good, right. they were fine. Right. So there was always pressure on me. My dad always said, if your grades are going to drop, right. you're going to be you know, doing badly, I'm going to stop your sport. Right, he said and that. Right. From from right. the uh, from the star, class, fourth standard all the way to the twelfth and graduate, mm. you know, graduation. But uh, so that was a responsibility that I had to right. be a good student. Right. But of course, swimming always took priority. priority. Right. And uh, in terms of parental support, they moved cities and jobs for me. Oh, it was. And for back you. in 1999, this was quite unheard of. There weren't. I'm sure. Yeah. And then I went to Bangalore and I did well. And right. I started this whole team, whole trend of athletes moving to Bangalore. Especially swimmers, nice because they right. saw swimmers saw success. Right, and today the country's best athletes are all training in Bangalore. Okay, so the people at that point, when you look at 19, back in ninety nine, mm. it was not heard of. Way. Yeah, it even was, today, it's I think quite insane for a dad to quit his job and change his job just for his son's people sport. Sports quota most of the time. Exactly, yeah, they do it as long as they need to for a college education right. or for a scholarship or that sort of thing yeah. or a quota. Right. But for me, they, they saw a hardworking kid who had goals and they both of them basically said we are going to do what it needs, what it takes to get him to these goals. That's how solid they were. And athletes today have that right. and many athletes don't have that. So I call it a luxury really. Mm. I had that luxury and then I... Uh, gave respect to that effort that was being put in into my career by giving back in terms of my effort in the pool. Right. So th- when was your, you know, m- that moment of that, yes, okay, Olympics is near. You you can see it. You can see it. Like you did qualify for it, but you know, you right. already know at the back of your head that I'm going to make that. So when did that happen? Honestly, it never did. Never? <laughs> it never did. Because yeah. the way the qualifying standards are set, to right. get to the Olympics, they are, it's a very high standard that mm. you have to re- reach to be an Olympian. All right. So by that I mean that is you have to, one is you have to be number one in the country. Right. Now, it's a it, you're racing the country's best athletes. So right. every time you get onto the starting blocks, mm. there are some days you know you're going to win and some days you don't. Before you even die. Before you even die. So right. that was when you're at the top of your game and I was then I would know that I've got this. Race. Right. You know, then you're basically racing against yourself. But will you explain the other side when you know that, okay, shit, there's going to be shit now. You already knew that before jumping. I, but luckily for me, I had very few days like that in right. a career that spanned 20 years. Uh-huh. Where I knew it's going to be shit. More often than not, I knew maybe this would be a tight race. Right. And 70 to 80% of the time, I knew I'm winning. Right, right. So being number one in the country, while it was a struggle to get there, once Mm. I was there, that was one part of getting to the Olympics ticked off. As you know, you can... Then second part is you have to hit a certain qualifying time. Yeah. That FINA, like you have FIFA and football. FINA is the world swimming body. They said for you. Now, these standards are world-class standards. And I actually, in my first attempt to 2004, I failed. Right. And I decided I'll quit swimming. Okay. And then I came back again. Because, of the, fa- because of the failure? It, it was Not a- failure, just because I wanted to be an Olympian. That was my goal. Yeah. You know, so you have that, you learn how to fight and right. restart and right. try again. Right. At 2004 is where I attempted to qualify. It was for the Athens Olympics. All right. And uh, there was a qualifying time. Right. And which was two minutes and four seconds. Two minutes and four seconds for the 200 meter four butterfly. butterfly. And That's I your, was the best yeah, butterfly. butterfly swimmer in the country. So like, uh, so I had met that first criteria right. of being number one. Right. But now I had to go ahead and get that timing. If right. I didn't get that time, I wouldn't This qualify. was FINA. FINA, the FINA qualifying, qualifying time. Right. 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 And uh, one year out, I was at two minutes and um, six seconds. Right. So I was two seconds off the qualifying right. mark. I landed up at this Malaysian Open, which was a qualifying championship where uh-huh. you have to choose certain championships around the world right. which are accredited by FINA which is the right. world swimming board right. so I landed up at the Malaysian Open and I let nerves get the better of mm-hmm. me I was 16 right so I was very young immature and I was attempting to make you know get get there 
and I failed. Right. And uh, I went from not only did I not qualify, I went even slower with from my own personal best. Uh-huh. And that was a big hit. Right. I, mean, I hit as in it was it was uh, has to be it was be. horrible. And I came back to India and I decided I want to quit swimming. Right. Because at sixteen I had already achieved uh, probably more than other sixteen year olds had achieved ever in yes, Indian yes, swimming. So yes. if my next goal was to be an Olympian and that wasn't happening. My question was, why was I swimming? Right. I gave it a month of, you know, swimming off and on up to a point where I said, no, I'll try again. Yeah. And like, we'll come to that again later. But that's how I restarted my journey to eventually reach the Beijing Olympics. All right. Uh, I want to talk about your diet. Like, how did it go? My, my diet? Your diet when you were training professionally. When like I that. was, well, when I was training, <clears throat> swimmers are very lucky. Because we burn so many calories yes. through a day that we are allowed to eat pretty much everything when yeah. we are training hard. Plus, you were 16, 17, so the metabolism is it's so huge. super it's high. Still is. I <laughs> still love you and we are Parsi. So, Parsi eat pretty yes. much everything. We love our food and I am a foodie. Right. So, uh, but it wasn't ever really a challenge uh-huh. because to stay off junk and to stay off sugar right. when I needed to yeah. didn't feel like a challenge because I, it just felt like part of. The other hard work that I'm doing to reach my goals. But did you really have to leave junk or something? I did. I would. I would. I, you can't really eat dessert and sugar every, every, and junk every day right. because with how, no matter how hard you're training, you're going to put on excess body fat, which oh. sorry only hurts you right. in the pool. So in terms of diet, generically you have to have uh, lots of carbs right. sure. pre practice yeah. yeah. and lots of protein after practice. Right. And then you've got your whey protein shakes. <coughs> you know, your even uh, when you were 16, you were having your... Oh, I was on supplements from the age of 14. You have to be. Right. Because of the hours you're training and oh. the amount of weights you're lifting, you can't do it only on a... Right. Just a pure diet. Especially back in 99 and 2000 when we didn't have the science and the brains that we have today where today people are talking about going vegan. Yeah, plant-based. And yeah. plant-based and yeah. just getting off all sort of supplement completely. We didn't have that knowledge at that point. Uh, Having said that, I was very, I mean, my dad and my mom, very careful as to what they gave me. Because on one hand, you don't want to take anything that's damaging to a young kid. And on the other, we have to be very careful also because uh, you've got certain standards that you have to meet. Right. And you cannot be cheating and, you know, having anything that is illegal either. So I was obsessively careful about what I had and didn't have in terms of supplements. But yes, there was a protein supplement that I had to have post-workout. I would make sure I got enough carbs in before in terms of rice and potato and fruit. And that time, mm-hmm. all these supplements were mostly imported. And if you buy it from right. India, India, there were a lot of cases of adulteration. Right? So exactly. you have to be really careful with no, your No, not only in India, even abroad, you would have, because a lot of the, the best manufacturers, the top companies, right. have one, uh, one plant that manufactures for bodybuilders, uh-huh. where steroids uh, abuse and steroids are allowed. Yeah, yeah. And then another plant with the same company that right. man, you know manufactures for all other athletes. Right. Sometimes there could be cross contamination. Sure, sure. So we've got to be, we had to be very careful. Only reputed company, right. companies were ones that so we did used. You once I used a supplement, once I, that was what I stuck through through my own okay. career. Okay, okay. Just to be safe. Right. Yeah. 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 So did you have a dedicated uh, dietitian or nutritionist with you? My dad. Your dad. Yeah. So doesn't Nobody the board else. take care of? The best player on the like board, like you, you know, the swimming no, board, no, no, because uh, we came together as a national team only a month out of a big tournament. Okay, right. So the swimming, uh, the swimming fraternity is such that like while most of the top swimmers come out of Bangalore, you've got two or three good centers at least in my time and even now. Right, training yeah, all of us in Bangalore, some from Delhi, some from up, you know, down south, but. Uh, primarily, we are all training together in one or two of these centers in Bangalore, right. and uh, we go to our national championships. And the best swimmers at that national championships get selected as part of the national team to race abroad. Right. Then we all come together in a national camp, right. which is either in Delhi or in Bangalore again at the right. Sai Center, Sports Authority of <clears throat> India yeah. Center. There are in-house doctors and nutritionists, but rarely do you want to change around. A pattern or a program you that you're changes. working with mm, that works for, for the whole year that's right. been working right just especially one month out of a major tournament right because you can't even begin to trust that person till you work with him for a longer period of time and i'm not trusting a doctor i've met <laughs> just or i yeah. plan to meet only for 20 days leading right. to right so we've got our own systems and set up mm. today when i play golf right i have nutrition right. right 
we are talking about you know not that even even six or seven years ago, Indian um, nutritionists were starting to become popular with that. sports nutritionists. They sports. weren't. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. wasn't a big yeah. field right. before that. Right. So, like I said, that was done with, through my dad, and mm-hmm. my dad also is in the industry. Okay. So it's not like he was an absolute layman. Right. He makes food and medicines for racehorses. The way you behave so, and talk, you look like you have a military background. I don't think no, that's the case. I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't have a military background. <laughs> but a, I'm, I'm, stereotypical, but yeah, you yeah. have that. <laughs> No, so he, 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 and we always make sure we were thorough with our, what we felt we needed to do. Right. And again, it's trial and error. Right. It's figuring out what works best for you because you can be working with the best nutritionist in the yeah. country. But at, after a point, you have to figure out, and I tell this to swimmers who I train today, right. that I may be a great coach or not, but that final bit is on you. Right. And how you put together your race or how you put together your food. Or your, right. So we are... Coaches and experts are there for advice and to mm. steer you, steer an athlete in the right direction. Right. But then he has to go down that road himself at the end of the day. And since we were talking about diet, diet, so a lot of people follow stars as well, right? So the global stars, they they follow. So if you see Michael Phelps, everyone, the way that guy eats, he's lean as a swimmer, right? right? But right. he's like up to, at his prime, he was doing 8,000 to 10,000 calories a day. Right. With massive pizzas and all. Right. So, I'm sure a swimmer burns a lot. But, I mean, you know, I'm sure you can't no, eat 8,000 calories. A lot of that was also around PR leading right. up into his Olympics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you're eating that amount of calories, but you're not eating it the way it's shown that you're eating. Right. So, you're not having pizzas and pancakes. Every and so day. You're not doing that. The body cannot do that. You're, you're having food and right. then you're having supplementation also. Right. For example, when you have a whey protein or you have a supplement called creatine monohydrate, right? right? It's protein. Right. It's produced in the body. Right. But if you mix a spoon of a whey protein or that supplement right. in a glass of juice and drink it, right. that's that's why it's called a supplement because right. it's equal to having three steaks. Right. Now, can a human being ingest three steaks mm. before his mm. training? No, he can't. Right. So the pizzas and the pancakes and the food that you see, say, maybe on YouTube or right. that he were to be eating every day to put together that 8,000 is right. just to show how much, how many calories went into it. But it's not necessary that he was actually eating all that for breakfast. All You cannot physically and do it. And training twice a day. And training, <laughs> you cannot do it. Yeah. So that's why I said it's important that you have an informed <coughs> uh, nutritionist mm. who knows how to put together the amount of calories right. you need for your event that you're training. For example, today with golf, I sit down with my nutritionist and I tell him or her exactly what my day's routine is going to be. They figure out how many calories I'm burning through the day. And then based on what I want to do, if I want to get thinner and trimmer, they'll give me a certain calorie plan. If I want to put on bulk, they give me another calorie plan. So it's all very, very, you know, uh, bespoke and created, like it's created, tailor-made for the athlete. And that is something that we as athletes did not have back then. Sure. Back then, not yeah. that it's. I mean, I don't mean to make myself sound old. Yeah. But till the, like I said, till the 2010 and 12 onward, right. sports nutritionists really didn't have an important role right. to play in Indian sport abroad. Right. They all had it, which is why we are mm. always catching, catching up. up. Yeah. And now we are we are getting there. We've got some really good people that I am working with. Right. So um, we need a lot of research, research of our own, right? Like there should be a wing. That do you feel the same? Because re, not research really, but the, the the doctors and the scientists that are working with the athletes need to be doing it. If you could call it research for long enough to know what works for that athlete. If today I am working with a new physical fitness, right? I mean, a fitness guy in the gym, right? He's going to take a good six months to figure out what makes me tick. Yeah. And what makes me think may not necessarily be what may, makes the next guy. Right. So if right. I'm coaching today, I can't follow the same technique or pattern mm-hmm. that I follow with one child vis-a-vis another. Right. I have to adapt to that person. Right. So each coach or uh, uh, doctor or nutritionist or strength trainer has to be very, you know, committed to figuring out what makes this my this I mean this client yeah. what works for him. And then you keep working on that and you keep evolving. Right. And the trend that is prevailing right now, the prevalent trend of fitness trainers and all, do you see a dark side to that? Like everyone's a trainer? Absolutely. Right. I see a major issue. Right. uh, Especially after I stopped competitive swimming and I got into competitive golf. Right. I initially put on a lot of weight. Right. Because uh, I'm, like I said, we were still used to eating so many 
calories through the day. My right. body wants it, but I'm not necessarily right. burning it. Right. So I got into uh, um, a weight loss sort of target, a mm. program, and I gave myself seven months to get there. Right. And I got there in right. I think four months. But while I was part of that process in the gym, I made sure that I worked with somebody who knew his stuff. Mm. But around me, I saw, you know, and not only, I mean, in several gyms that I worked with, right. where you've got gyms, are, today I feel a lot of gyms are very, very eager to certify their own trainers with two and three week courses so right. they can then promote themselves to the world saying, right. we've got an X number of certified, certified people yeah. on this level. Yeah. And apart from that, and these have been cases that have been uh, happening from the time I was swimming as well. Where you've got trainers who are very keen to make you see results. Right. So they sell you supplementation right. and those supplements could be spiked. Right. Because they want results. Sure. So uh, the, the message to young kids or parents today is you do your homework before you hire a trainer. Right. And you join a gym. Right. And that is just for safety. Hmm. Then you do further homework with your trainer to figure out what works best for your sport and your event. Right. That comes second. Right. So there's a safety issue. And there is also an knowledge issue to see if this guy actually knows what he's mm-hmm. doing. And then after that safety issue, it is, is my program tailor-made to my spot? Or am I doing something very general? Right. And then if you're looking at the absolute other extreme, there are guys who, just, you know, they're certified by a gym and uh, they're giving you exercises with lift, kids are lifting weights with right. the wrong posture. Yeah. And it may not hurt them now, but they're setting themselves up for, you know, spine trouble 10 years down. Right. So it's better to spend a little more money mm. any way you're investing. Right. But invest well and do your homework before you invest. Right. In a in a person for your child is right. my you know advice to parents today. And talking about gyms, do you see a decline in kids, you know, going for sports nowadays? I feel there is, uh, you know, because everyone wants to just spend the evening of their mm-hmm. lives, right, in a gym, in a, mm-hmm. in a gym. Fine, you need a good body. It gives you a good body, right, yeah, you right. know, whatever. But earlier there was like, you know, people used to go, since I, I was a kid and I was put in a stadium stadium. Like I was made to choose. So I chose gymnastics and right. then I went to table tennis. Right. Represented, I wasn't good, good, but I was into sports. Correct. So I know the, and I think that's really important for a kid to, you know, grow up in a competitive environment. Correct. So now you don't see that. People just want to either do Netflix or they want to play PUBG on their phones or right. they want to go to the gym, Correct. which is good. But not gym for sport. Yeah, exactly. I think I, I'm not... I've not seen enough to to say whether there is a decline or not, but I know there is definitely this is pre- prevalent in society today, right. where more often than not kids are not even going to the gym. Yeah. You know, they rather sit on the iPads or they you know do their PUBG or their yeah. online gaming, and they're talking to their friends across Love it though. the city. Very and it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> And and the, the that's the great part about sport, right? That it pulls you away from exactly. all that, exactly, and it gives you direction. Hmm. So there are there are times when I've been working with siblings, right? And uh, one sister is playing sport, the other is, and you can see how focused one sister is, right? And how the other is just lost, right? You know, so sport. That's why sport is important. And fine, join a gym. I mean, I'm, I have nothing against people who go into the gym to just look good. Yeah. I today go uh, for, while I was on my weight loss program. Right. I was in the gym to look good, right? Not for golf. Hmm. Once I got that done, now I'm in the gym for my sport. Program. Right. So I think the first thing is. The problem is kids sitting on technology and not being active. Mm. It need not necessarily be a gym. Mm. You can still spend three hours downstairs in your building playing all evening. That has reduced. Right. I don't, I'm not even judging whether that child is a cricketer or a football player or wants to swim. Uh But is he sitting on Wi-Fi at home or is he downstairs doing something that is active? Right. So when I'm doing, say for example, a talk on fitness. Right. We did this uh, masterclass in... uh, in uh, Phoenix, okay. in Market yeah. City, in yeah. uh, Orlando, Market. Bombay. And that was one of the questions that yeah. my uh, the parents asked me in the Q&A. Right. That, uh, my child is always on his iPad, what do you suggest? <laughs> you know, yeah. There's no suggestion, it's right. not like it's rocket science. Right. You've got to shut down that technology yes. and push your child to go out. And unless they experience that... Yeah. Parents are responsible. They, parents, they, it's, it's a, they need to put their foot down. lies with the parents yes. and from the beginning. It's not about... Uh, uh, waking up at 16, hmm. you can't tell a 16, a teenager to put down his or her phone yeah. I mean, you can try, yeah. but it's about set, it's a habit that you set 
from a young age right. which is why people like me right. the more they build awareness about the importance of staying fit uh-huh. and sport just getting out and playing more right that's a huge added value to you know to society not just going and winning medals for the country right that's that yes you're an asset when you do that right but if you can educate parents and you can educate youngsters right as to how beneficial and mm. important playing sport even just to for the fun of it is right not to go and win mm. that i think that is a bigger role that i have today than when i as just one individual brought back a medal yes you know educating the masses or just bringing about some awareness about the benefits of sport like that so i really want to, that also brings me to your motivational mm. speaking events right. so right. yeah how did you get into that and how does it work how does it exactly right. work like if i if i sit on youtube right and you just type because people want right. to look at motivation correct so i've realized that most of the times it's hans zimmer's music that is motivating exactly. me, you know yeah, time like exception yeah, yeah or a dark night song yeah, yeah exactly so anyone is like, blabbering something okay he's you know yes, because, yes. you know he's psyched up and he's just talking whatever correct. needs to be heard but correct. people like you who actually you know achieved i would rather listen to you without music so that's yeah, that's that. the that's the catch where why it works uh-huh. i'll get to what i do in a bit but right. why it works is people connect with the person right for example if i am uh, speaking to a, sp- a sports academy uh-huh. full of kids of different sports right the minute i talk about my olympic journey right you know the i will right later. the minute i talk about failure right. in sport and my experiences of failure mm-hmm. that's where you have the audience in the palm of your hand literally because oh, okay. there's more chance there's a huge chance that the majority of kids they have are not fully successful yet yeah where they are facing road blocks and failures mm-hmm. so the min- that's where the connect happens where they say okay this guy rehan is standing here he looks no different from us right he is human and human right you know that's my goal mm-hmm. when it's with a younger audience right that you get them to relate to you from the beginning that even i can fail i have failed exactly right, and my right, right. in terms of how it started i was uh, running a workshop so uh-huh. my workshops are called swim smart with rehan yes sir. right so they are technique based workshops right. skill sharpening mental preparation right we do i do one on one sessions then i do groups and then i work with teams on right. a consultancy right. basis so at the end of these workshops that i would run over a weekend i'm talking about 6 years ago in bombay mm. i did a quick q and a right with the parents and the swimmers and right. then one of the questions ended up having a very long answer from that answer the guy who asked that question to me he came back and he said you you know you have a, i can see you have a lovely connect with the audience kids like to listen to you why don't you come to my office and we'll do a mm-hmm. talk so that's how i went to his office and started my <coughs> talk. and then from there we spoke at uh, you know the the cii summit young indian summit clo uh-huh. so you you do a bunch of corporate talks and you can invite it to private corporate the confederation of indian industry uh, exactly. right, 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 right. so you do a bunch of those and then people know you're a speaker on the uh-huh. circuit and then they <clears throat> invite you for private stuff and <clears throat> also for you know sports schools academies that sort of thing but uh, the theme of my talk right. is called lessons learned from a lifetime in sport right and it they aren't just sports and they are not specific. they are lessons learned which can take you through in any part of your life no right. matter who you are you could be a mom right a housewife you could be somebody who is climbing up the corporate ladder you could be a you know a 10 year old but they've got lessons for everybody in there right. and the way i try to make it fun is i te- i tell a story that's the so best i'm thing telling that. a story <laughs> i'm making you cry i'm making you smile mm. i'm making you reach a high of you know and i'm trying to make and for youngsters i'm trying to make them believe and understand that it's possible to set these goals and right goals. because a lot of them come in very raw and very also very negative not only youngsters i've had 45 50 year old men whose questions have depressed me so i can imagine how how give, negative they could be give, give an example uh Uh, as simple i was going to talk in uh, lonavala for one a cop, german right. german automobile company and uh, the guy stood up and he said i loved your talk but i have been a failure all my life uh-huh. and uh, because i didn't want to i couldn't achieve anything though i tried in three sports now i put too much pressure on my daughter to achieve and because i put too much pressure on my daughter to achieve she has quit her sport now he you can all of this he, he knew it and he couldn't help so how do i get out of it i said i cannot change the past but right. the point is that question was so intense right you can imagine what he's going through yeah. and what his daughter went through to stop her sport right right so these are questions that are very uh 
I wouldn't say negative or depressing. They are. It's reality. Yeah. And it's reality yeah. of so many parents and athletes today. Right. Even when I do a corporate talk, hmm. I have a separate segment segment that is built. Uh, I talk about team building. I talk about leadership. Right. You know. So those are. Those are the, that's that part of my talk is reserved for a corporate, slightly older audience. Right, right. But invariably, even in the Q and A of a corporate talk, mm-hmm. I have more guys stand up asking me about how to be better parents to their kids, right? Than talk about how to build a better team in the office. Oh, they become fathers, right? Rather than general managers, and oh, you get what crazy. I'm saying. Yeah, and that's that's nice because you then you get to see the human side of people, right? And, of course, you're going to have appreciation from an audience if you speak well and right. you connect with your audience. But when a question like that comes up, you wow. know you you've done a great talk, right? Because other, why is this guy who is so successful in his firm, right? Why is he standing up and able to open up to me, who's at to that point a complete stranger, stranger yeah. about something that's so important to yes. him and his whole company as well? Uh-huh. And at that point, he's not the GM of his company or the you know associate. He is a dad. Yes. So that's yeah. why you know you've tapped into the his the human side of your audience. Right. So if I get a question like that from a corporate audience, I know I've done a great corporate talk. Yeah. If good. I don't, I know I've just done a good talk. Good indicator. But yeah. motivational speaking is is uh, is something I enjoy doing. Right. I want to be get even better at it. Right. And uh, I'm going to you know. And you've got credentials to back it up as well. Like you know. It's you've got examples. Right. Also. Of you, it's not. It's not that I'm just preaching. Right. I also practice what I preach even today right. with, with my golf. Right. And the key, I think, is to get the audience to believe that they could be you, right. or they even are you. Right. If they see your mirror. Right. You've got your audience. So it's not just it. the oratorical skills that you can speak well. It's like you know. Right. No, you. Of course, you have to. Uh, You've got people who can speak well fluently in English, and then you people who can't. Right. But uh, a successful speaker is somebody who I keep saying the same thing again and again. But somebody who can instantly connect right. with his audience. Right. Right. And the way you gave that example, right? That guy standing up and saying, you know, initial was that what a loser. My that was the first, uh, you know, yeah. that was my yeah. impulsive yeah. reaction. But right. then I respect the guy that he owns the fact that he absolutely messed his life up, and now right. he's messing and his body. Yeah. And how and he wants to learn. Right. And if uh, somebody who he was a successful guy, he's mm. part of a team that runs a huge company, right. right? But if somebody who's already successful is open to learning, right. I think that's the first yes. step towards being yes. a champion. With the famous quote, "Success is never final; learning right. never ends." Right. You have to have, and this is when you know you on radio interviews and on TV, you always get that last question is, "What is your advice to the youth?" Of it? Right. Right. I, this is one of the first things I say that teach your children to learn right. and be open to learning. And right. if it's directly to an athlete or even a corporate leader or whoever he is, right. always be open to learning. And that can only come if you don't have an, a big ego. Right. Yes. I know stuff. That is a, that is very helpful. No, of course, you know because you if you're already successful, you've right. reached that point in your life because you you know stuff. Right. But not I know it all. Hmm. You know, you have to even as a national champion. I had my weaknesses. One right. of my weaknesses in the pool was breaststroke. Right. Right. So I that was my weakest stroke. Right. And uh, I couldn't figure out how to do it better. Right. Over a period of time, so I would sit down an hour before we swam the senior batch swam, and I would watch the eight and nine year olds swimming breaststroke. Okay. You know, because a child does something so innocently, so naturally, before he's corrected by a coach. Right. So I would just watch little kids train and okay. the way they just, you know, swam the stroke right. and try to pick up something from that. Now, did, did, does did, a, did, of course it helped. Yeah. It, did, it didn't make me a champion in the stroke, you but it, it did that, got the job done yeah. for the event I was swimming. Right. So you, the point is, point is that you have to have no ego when you practice right. and then you can have the biggest ego when you go and you go into a competition. Yeah. I've often noticed when two people talk, right? So they talk about some third person who's actually doing good in some, you know, area right. field that the other person is not related to. Over. So they often diss the thing that, okay, yeah, so what, so what, yeah, 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 I know. So I'm always interested in how is he managing that? I want to learn that. I want to tap into his routine just so that I can extract right. something noteworthy, right? Correct. I see this lacking in a lot of people, like this negative ego, as you mentioned, right? It just comes up. 
so yeah people have to shed that thing off in order to of learn course, in order yeah, to learn. Yeah. Yeah. you know you have to you cannot with today when i'm practicing at golf yeah i am uh, yet to get on to the national circuit i really want to talk about your golf routine right. like yeah so maybe this is a yeah this is, i'm dying to be competitive again right i want to be on the national circuit do you, do you miss to, that feeling that i am yeah. doing that because i miss the competitive right, feeling right but the first big tournament i play at mm-hmm. i'm not going to win right i'm going to finish somewhere at the bottom right sure so what's that going to do to my ego i'm used to dominating right but i'm there i'm working continuously with coaches where i'm asking more questions than they are giving advice right because i want to learn and i uh-huh. want to learn fast right so if i walked on to a golf course or right. a training session uh-huh. and i went there with the attitude of i am an olympian right and an arjuna award winner and therefore i am going to be champion at this there's nothing that's going to happen mm, yeah. in fact i have played with other golfers who tell me you're too hard on yourself we expected you to show up a little more okay yeah sh- i'm mm-hmm. sure they did i'm sure they i mean yeah. but they said it from a space of have a little more self confidence right because oh, okay. i am somebody who beats myself up all the right. time if right. i'm not doing well right so but that always comes from the the positive side of it is I, my mind is just open mm-hmm. to advice and my mind is open to learn right it can be from anyone then of course you have to have a filter to know what to listen to yes. and what not to yes. listen to but that's just advice that a child should just run with no ego learn you become right. a champ- you try when you're at your competition arena right. have the biggest ego right. you can even have a little arrogance right. it's good right but when you're practicing when you're learning your craft mm. learn any way you can right yes makes all the sense in the world right so i mean i have i'm i'm full of <laughs> you know do do you want to share anything anything that you want to talk about um what are your plans like uh, golf i understand that you're going to go like competitive but <clears throat> you know life uh rehan not in the sports and competitive yeah unfortunately there's not much else to say because sport has been yeah you know my life but i've always been somebody who i think enjoys the spotlight right i enjoy the attention right. i love right appreciation like i said in right. the beginning or adulation from the you know crowd i feel that appreciation right. so i am uh, playing golf today and though it's sport i want it to be a means where i really really shine more than i have right. and i'm not afraid to say so right you know i want to be known in every household right in the country right. if i am not already right and i want to be known all over the world and the yeah. the way i'm going about doing it is and i'm working very hard again at a second right. spot right and my eventual goal is to be in a double olympian by right. that i mean that i want to be the first athlete in india who's been an olympian in two sports right Now, that is a very tall order it's a very big yeah. goal but uh, have set up process and the tunnel vision is set now right it's golf now it's golf for sure now right. and uh, to fund my golf like we spoke about i do these corporate talks motivational yes. speaking uh, another passion of mine is travel right so i have a friend uh, gitika we jointly go on and run a travel blog okay so what travel, is it called travel with rehan travel with rehan yes should i so know about that you should, yeah. my my so, research sucks <laughs> no, so we do that and right. i do a bit of travel writing for um, you know media houses and press as well right so we've covered we've traveled a lot and right. uh, the idea behind that was is that while i swam i visited pretty much the best cities in the world but couldn't enjoy but couldn't enjoy right. Right? because there was pressure around uh-huh. today sure. before i become really good in golf and you right. can still enjoy a city a lot more when you play golf right. because it's spread over five days yes. tournament mm. uh i want to go back to those places and i already have yeah. a lot of them and see more of the world right. without the pressure of yeah, competing and yes, yes. and uh, so travel has always been a passion Expo- exploring different uh, food cuisines of different countries yes, as, sure. as well yeah. like most of us i mean right. who wouldn't love to right. travel plus so you, you are... i do that and that also in a way enables me to travel right. to play different golf courses around the world mm. that uh, another uh, amateur player of my a standing would not get to play right so we do that as well right. and uh, so that's another thing i do right. and um, i work with uh, youngsters as part of the you know the swim smart with rehan right. kacha which is a skip, like i said the workshops that i do mm-hmm. which gives me great joy because it's my first passion it must be really it's fulfilling fun. right that it's very fulfilling yes. to see a kid you know help him achieve his dreams mm-hmm. and goals it's sad that i cannot commit to it full time because of golf but i have had eight, you know several <clears throat> investors and parents tell me that just start your own 
full time academy right i have had people in balewadi and pune who right. already have academies in different spots right. say let's do a right. joint thing i'll set you up with academies all over But the country can't go with golf right no. and i have had to say no yeah i understand it's not that i had to it was a choice right and that's like turning down a whole future that's set up for you right because there's somebody else willing to do all the mm-hmm. hard work and the investment to basically have 10 swim smart clinics and academies running all over the country right you know that's every entrepreneur's dream yes so it's there sitting saying no to that yeah and i'm taking the risk of saying no to that yes. because i don't believe that if i if i put my name up on an academy right. and i'm not there 24/7 for the kids it's unfair to the mm. kids right of course you can always set it up and then have other people run right. it but you need to spend a lot of time in the initial one right. or two years to set it up that's time i don't have right i'm sure you gambled but i i'm also sure that you're getting better sleep now so because you committed to golf because i'm getting have... better sleep because i know i've, I've got clarity in terms <laughs> yes. of what my passion is yes but i'm getting no sleep because i am a very uh, while i'm a, a, a very dedicated to staying with the you know staying the course for the long run right i'm also very impatient okay so it's both right. so wh- while i know this, this is going to take a good 10 years mm. or 6 years i've already been playing for 6 years right while i know i have to commit another four to it right to start seeing real results yes. or the results i want to see right i still want the results to happen tomorrow right. morning right so that impatience uh uh-huh. I think makes that's, that's, what, that, that, that's, that's what keeps you, you know, going. That's what right? keeps you wanting to go back and practice the right. next day. That's right. what wakes you up in the morning. Yes. And you cannot be the best at a sport or anything in life unless you are constantly reinventing yourself hmm. and you're constantly constantly setting difficult goals as well. Right. Awesome. <laughs> I will, I think it, it was awesome, Ryan. Thank thank you for doing this with us. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank Lovely you. talking to you. Thank you so much.